my name is Ed Bice. I work at Medan. Uh, we work on fact-checking software and translation software. Um, this panel is going to be rather <coughs> ad hoc. Um, I was asked to uh, moderate the panel about 36 hours ago and, uh, and uh, thought, uh, uh, said to Dan, well, everything in moderation, including moderating. Uh, so I agreed to do it. Um, and uh, I think we've got a great uh, set of panelists um, and we'll uh, kick the uh, panel off with uh, five to 10 minutes from each of the panelists. Um, and then we're gonna open it up and take questions and you know, hope to engage a discussion around the general theme of annotation, fact-checking, the future of journalism, and uh, aspects of uh, media literacy that, that Mike will bring uh, into the discussion. So I'm gonna ask uh, each of the panelists to introduce themselves, and, and then we'll go to Stefan, who will introduce himself and, uh, introduce himself and give uh, the opening uh, remarks. And then we'll go back to the other panelists who will offer their opening remarks, and then, and then we'll uh, uh, open up the discussion. So um, uh, I, I, I have to note and apologize for the fact that this is a, a mantle, and uh, uh, so, so I, 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 I disclaim any, uh, 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 well, I, I just note that. So um, <laughs> I'll, I'll uh, pass the mic here, and, and, and then we'll come around to uh, Stefan. Hi, I'm Emmanuel Vincent. I'm a climate scientist from training, and I started a project called Climate Feedback, and when I arrived in the US, as I realized the state of uh, the news coverage of climate change, and the goal of climate feedback was to bring scientists who are experts on the topic to provide feedback on the credibility of content, of uh, news coverage of climate change. Hi, my name is Mike Caulfield. I work at Washington State University, and I'm running a cross-institutional project to teach students uh, basic fact-checking skills. Hi, I'm Wes Lindemood, and I'm a designer on the visuals team at NPR. NPR um, is National Public Radio, but uh, our, our team is, is focused on, uh, on the visual expression of that uh, in, in the newsroom. Okay, great. Uh, I think at this point we'll uh, pass it over to Stefan. So, Stefan, if you can introduce yourself and uh, uh, provide us with some uh, insights into your work. Sure. Hey, uh, thanks for having me here. I hear my my voice with an echo, but I will try to ignore that. Um, so, I am a Romanian investigative journalist. I live now in Germany for a while, and I started. Um, I co-started, uh, co-founded, and now coordinate uh, an investigative journalist network together with uh, the Spiegel, and this is called European Investigative uh, Collaborations. But I have a long um, track record in investigative journalism out of Romania in Eastern, in the Eastern European context, in the non-profit uh, investigative journalism world. Um, my focus is um, investigating, investigating organized crime. And recently, I was also starting to be active in the uh, research uh, field. I'm enrolled as a PhD researcher doing work on um, uh, networks, cross-border ne networks for investigative journalism. So now, as far as I understand, I would start directly my presentation, so bear with me for a second, um, and I will show you. Okay, so I'll try to be uh, fast on this and I don't have much feedback being, being um, alone in a small room here. Um, so again, my name is Stefan Kandea and I will speak now about how um, networks I'm part of uh, 
to work with um, annotations. I am uh, the network uh, guide, uh, so to speak. Um, my uh, work consists in daily coordination uh, related to content investigations, but also um, informing about what tools uh, we should use as a network. Now, I will talk a bit about what uh, this EIC network is, um, who are the partners, a big project that we did recently, um, and uh, something about our workflow, workflow and tools, and how we experiment with annotations, namely with hypotheses. Um, what we are trying to do now in a um, separate context, putting search and annotations in a box, in an arm box, and my considerations related to issues, tech issues, especially in cross-border investigative journalism. So about EAC, we, are, um, um, we have one year of activity. We're focusing on Europe, um, and we focus on reporting and uh, publication of investigative journalism um, in Europe. Um, with topics that would affect European uh, communities. And we partner on in-depth reporting at source, meaning that we have uh, partners who are actively uh, knowledgeable and active involved in um, the different uh, countries in Europe. These are the, the partners for now. It's, the, yeah, it's a really broad mix of a uh, small non-profit like the Romanian Center for Investigative Journalism and the platform called the Black Sea uh, to really big partners uh, like Der Spiegel in Germany and uh, also new players like Mediapart in, in France, uh, digital players. And we do take project-based partners. So uh, from time to time, there are other partners uh, involved. Um, this is the example of the Black Sea, which is um, um, a platform in English to report in depth uh, about the region, uh, about the Black Sea region. Now, briefly about the Football Leagues, uh, which was our biggest project recently. It was an um, investigation, almost a year uh, long investigation into um, the European professional football. And it was based on a leak, uh, almost two terabytes of information, um, a lot of diverse uh, uh, files. Um, more than 60 journalists involved in uh, 12 countries working uh, across borders. Now, from, from that, I want to give you an overview on how we work project by project. So for each project, we do have a legacy network and some tool stack ready for from past projects. Um, during the pre-publication, when we know what we are working on, we go through refining the network, the tools we are using, and the workflow. And so we are in a constant... Um, dynamic flow about uh, testing new new tools and experimenting with new tools. We go then in the publication mode, uh, and that is a lot of uh, legal issues, uh, confrontation across different countries, embargoes, publication dates. So we switch between pre-publication and publication phases that involves uh, some secret work and then uh, public work. And we end up building a sort of uh, investigative platform out of that. And you will understand why when I go into details. We do have um, a search tool, which is one of the platforms that runs a search engine uh, with all the secret data sets we have. And we, we, use, we use a, a communication platform, um, which now uh, currently, and it was in Football Leagues, is based on Sandstorm. You should know about Sandstorm because it's uh, in your backyard. Um, on Sandstorm, we have this uh, apps that we use on daily communication, Rocket Chat, uh, on um, creating a, a knowledge base, doc wikis, and on different, a uh, few other issues like filing findings, which we use uh, the issues system from a GitLab instance. And in between these apps and uh, Sandstorm, um, in between the Sandstorm and the Hoover, uh, where the documents reside, we are experimenting with using a bridge uh, through annotations. Um, and of course, we try to engage directly on the source documents in the uh, search engine, marking findings, um, translating, which is uh, with our group of people, every, uh, every partner speaks a different language. And we try to um, uh, bridge between the platforms by uh, using a bot for, uh, for the rocket chat instance in Sandstorm. Basically, letting know people when an annotation was done on the source uh, document. Uh, we use um, hypothesis also, again, in an experimental way, because there is a lot of uh, problems we have having a small uh, tech team. 
Um, we use also, um, we tested an extension built by John Udell at Hypothesis to automate some of the um, tasks that we have as um, during the investigation. And that is um, trying to, um, to, to research, uh, search and search again new terms, uh, trying to add the findings to, uh, to a timeline. Uh, trying to create automatically uh, wiki pages from the findings and uh, trying to tag findings on um, um, and send these findings uh, in the footnotes or timeline of uh, of wiki pages. Um, another thing we are involved with um, annotation is uh, trying to um, package this bundle of tools in a more stable way. And my uh, my colleagues um, my my colleagues work on we work together, but uh, my my developer colleagues um, worked in the last few months in trying to put together in one box in one arm box uh, for for now search and annotations. So our search tool Hoover and annotations from Hypothesis, and this is part of a project which is uh, funded by uh, Google uh, Innovation Fund, um, which uh, has a contest in Europe and we we try to make these boxes uh, talk to each other we try to make these boxes um, 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 uh, use both search and annotations so at some point we can skip some of the applications um, in uh, uh, letting the group know about findings you have a URL here and because we, we don't have too much I will skip to the to the last slide basically um, the problems I have as a coordinator here and that the other journalists have is this growing uh, networks and the growing data we, we have and we exchange and um, uh, the question what 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 type of data is gather, uh, gathered in different networks or in different uh, tools there is some other type of data ga gathered saved analyzed in this collaborative project I do have um, um, to consider uh, what are the responsibilities and obligations for the journalists and the, the platform owners or operators, what are the tech limitations and where do you stop, you want to enhance the user experience or you want to keep safe their uh, search history by not saving any search logs. Um, I have these issues between centralization and uh, distri versus uh, distributed uh, systems, different threat scenarios because we do a lot of the work in secret, but we also want during publication to have it as much as possible exposed and have people uh, contribute it, uh, and, uh, and comment through annotations on our stories. And that's what we will try to do in the future. And of course, the biggest issues is this um, tools that work in an experimental way are great, but we don't have now the manpower to keep them uh, up to date, maintain, uh, develop them uh, further and look at all, all the different uh, consequences, especially security um, issues. Here you have my contacts and um, some of the uh, URLs that I've used, and I will wait and listen in for, for further questions. Thanks. All right, great. Thanks, Stefan. Great work. Okay, uh, next we're gonna hear from uh, Mike Caulfield. Uh, Mike is... Um, there is no sound here. A so. blogger and uh, academic uh, whose writings have uh, had crossed my uh, uh, desktop over the last couple weeks, and uh, before this this conference, I was actually wondering how am I going to get in touch with this guy. So, um, huge fan of his of his work. Everyone should read his blog, and uh, I'll, I'll with seen. that. Uh, this is a site called minimumwage.com. It talks about Denmark's $1.41 menu and how if you raise the minimum wage, uh, you know, you're, you're going to, um, you're going to, you know, increase the prices of all these uh, different meals, et cetera, and there's going to be less jobs because less people buy, et cetera, et cetera. I don't need to go into that piece of it, but um, the Stanford History Education Group recently ran a study where they took fact checkers. Uh, Stanford students and uh, history faculty, right, history professors, and they gave them this page and they said, hey, you know, what do you think about the authority and source of this page? Now, let me see if I can break out just for a minute. I'll show you how you actually 
uh, deal with this page here. I don't have that specific article up there, but it doesn't matter. But this is, this is sort of your garden path solution for do I trust this page. You hit the about, you find this part of this employment EPI group here. You uh, search Google for that. And then uh, when you uh, look at that, you see that there's SourceWatch here. Take SourceWatch, you can take something else. You can find multiple routes into this. You note that it's uh, associated with this guy, Rick Berman. And then when you search Rick Berman in minimumwage.com, you get a list of exposés about essentially an industry-fronted PR group, um, including ones that say that his nickname in the industry is Dr. Evil. So that's kind of interesting there, right? Um, it's a pretty simple solution. It's, there's nothing really complex about this. Now, how would you think that uh, people do when they're presented with this, uh, presented with this problem? Well, here is um, an exciting yet thoroughly depressing graphic. Uh, so we, we see the three groups here. We see checkers, right? We see historians and we see students. The checkers do great, right? The fact checkers do great. Um, within oh, uh, the meantime to finding out this EPI group, moving from minimumwage.com to EPI, uh, is about, um, what is that, 50 seconds. Um, by about 200 seconds, all the checkers have uh, associated this group with Berman, the front group, and understand its PR. At the point that all the checkers have done this, you know, the average historian hasn't even gotten to EPI. And as a matter of fact, the average, only 60% of historians, history faculty, will get to that point where they understand that this is a front group by this guy, Berman. Students are, of course, even slower. You see the students are there five minutes into this and they're finally reaching EPI. Uh, and only 40% of students will get uh, and make this connection within the, you know, relative time allotted. Uh, and again, this is, this is unpublished. I, I did check that it, I know this says draft, do not distribute on, on the actual slide, but I did get permission this morning, I swear. So, um, it, was presented, uh, it was presented last week at the um, um, educational research, big educational research con conference there, era or whatever you want to call it. So how does this relate to what we're trying to do with students, well, one of the things, this, this appeared in my stream uh, yesterday, uh, HP vaccines like kill a bunch of people. And this is the traditional thing our students deal with, right, is they come to a page like this. And what we've traditionally told students is read deeply, right, right? close reading. Look at the page, is there data, is it supported, are there experts? Um, what we find is actually none of that advice works. In fact, a lot of it's counterproductive, right? Is there data on this page? Yeah, look at this, there's a chart. There's numbers, right? There's dead pe numbers of dead people on there. You can't get more data than that, right? Um, we have an expert here, Dr. Diane Harper, right? And we can have the students go through this, and look at this, it's not only linked, it has footnotes, right? And they're kind of like, I don't, know, I don't know what format footnote that is, but it's some mishmash of something or other, uh, but it looks kind of science-y, right? And the more they apply our traditional right, our traditional methods to these documents, actually the worse they do, right? And if we go back to that other slide and we say, you know, these are Stanford students, by the way, only 40% of Stanford students are getting to that Berman. That's Stanford, right? I, I forget what the acceptance rate is in Stanford, but it's pretty low, right? It's kind of a selective school. <laughs> okay, so when we look at this and we say, why is this happening? A lot of it is our fault. It's our fault because we tell students, read deeply, look, look at the data, look for fallacies, try to match this up with all this stuff. Now what happens, this is why, and this is the end of my intro, this is why I'm interested in annotation, because what happens if instead of telling students, look at the page, think deeply about the page, what happens if you tell students, hey, annotate the page? Well, the first thing that happens is this. So I'll, I'll, grab, uh, I'll grab Dr. Diane Harper here. We'll throw her up here. We're going to annotate Dr. Diane Harper, you know, and what, we've, what we'll find is, you know, the first actual auto suggests is Diane Harper Snopes, urgent warning about Gardasil, uh, false. Now, you don't have to necessarily take that at face value, right? You don't have to necessarily believe everything Snopes tells you, but by the time you get to the Snopes page, 
they've done a lot of that work for you. And it turns out, if you read through this, it's a little more uh, nuanced than you might think. Uh, Diane Harper actually did work on some of the testing, and she does actually believe that promotion of pap smears over a lifetime is probably a better approach to cervical cancer than the vaccine, right? Does it have anything to do with 32 dead people and 9,000 people injured by Gardasil? No, it has zero to do with that. You can read through that. The thing about annotation is it gets our students to think about the web the way I think the web was you know, intentionally designed. It's, it's a bunch, uh, it's, a, it's a networked set of linked information, okay, which allows us, you know, we're not just handed a page, right, a printout of a website in the middle of a desert and say, you know, take a look at this. You know, does, does this look good to you? I mean, we have the web at our disposal. And so annotation, in my mind, is a way to kind of re-webify the web, right? Get our students to think like the web and start to think about where are the sources for this? How can we connect those sources? And it builds in students a better set of reflexes about how to approach information on the web than our traditional, very publication-based, very print-based, uh, methods, and that's what excites me about annotation, and uh, I'll pass it on to the next person. Uh, so, as I mentioned in the, uh, briefly, that I'm a designer on the visuals team at NPR, and the visuals team's a small team embedded in the newsroom that is uh, focused on new approaches to telling stories online. Uh, by, by that I mean web-native documentaries, data visualizations, and, and annotation work. Uh, Recently, uh, I, I should say by way of introduction that I'm, I'm pretty new to the world of annotation, uh, but I hope that, that you know, being new, I can provide a, a, unique, a unique perspective that's, that's valuable to the conversation. Uh, some of our earliest uh, annotation work started during the election season where we were um, doing live fact checks and analysis of, of the presidential debates. Uh, from there, we moved on to annotating um, inaugural addresses, Obama's farewell address, uh, We've worked with member stations through the NPR network to uh, annotate state house, uh, state house presentations, uh, you know, state uh, address by the governor in uh, Illinois. Uh, we've also worked with uh, stations in the network to embed our annotation work in other member station sites. So um, this whole ecosystem of different annotation approaches has kind of cropped up. Um, out of our, our initial work on the um, live debate annotation. Uh, what annotation means for us is a, is a pretty specific use case. We're using it inside the newsroom as opposed to creating an annotation tool that, that users can use. Um, but, but this is a unique set of users that I think have, have some interesting, um, you know, some interesting requirements and some interesting um, needs that we can serve. One of the things that I think annotation does for us that's really valuable is it breaks us out of an article mentality. We can think about a, this, you know, structured journalism to go to a, a specific point. A reporter doesn't have to rewrite uh, a whole article just to comment on a specific thing that Trump said or another public figure. Um, so it, it teaches us to write, it teaches us to, to think about reporting in a new way. I think the other thing it does for us is it allows reporters from different beats and different desks to collaborate in new ways. Uh, in, instead of having a science reporter write a science article about what uh, a public figure said and having a education reporter do the same thing, they can collaborate on the same source document. Um, so it allows opportunities for editors and, and reporters to collaborate in a new way. Um, there's one thing that I think, uh, you know, all of these projects share some common editorial and design goals in, in common. Uh, we, we, for our annotations, it wasn't just fact check work. We also thought, you know, as NPR, one of the things we feel we can bring to the conversation is context and analysis. Instead of just always just reporting on what, what's happened, how can we take a step back and provide analysis and, and, and some space to think about um, the, the, you know, the, the news. So um, that, that is true for all of our annotation work. Uh, in the case of the debates, I'll use, just use that as a specific example. We took that and that, that general goal and, and had some targeted goals around, um, around the election of identifying new issues, verifying claims, calling out general campaign themes. These are things that our editors were thinking about, and the editors, uh, as, as I'll talk about more in a second, play a really critical role in helping to guide and, and, and guide all the reporters. Um, 
in, in thinking about our design goals, one of the things that was really important was making our annotations the focal point of this experience, which is a little bit different, I think, than some of the other um, examples we've seen today where annotation is a layer on top of. But for us, we felt like the value that we were bringing to the conversation, instead of just sharing the transcript and having users take the extra step to explore the annotations, we wanted to present our annotations front and center. Um, the, the challenge that they presented from a design perspective was as you have multiple annotations, as you have, you know, we had 15 reporters working on, on, on debate night. Um, how, do you, how do you aid in the scannability of, of the transcript? How do you allow users to easily move from navigation, uh, from annotation to annotation? Uh, and also, um, how, how do you alert users to the presence of new annotations? So these were some of the things we were thinking about from a design perspective, as well as then making sure that this was designed in such a way that it could be flexible and, and work as an embed on a member station site or work in several different concept, contexts. Um, as, as far as, as um, highlight, you know, establishing the expertise of, of what it was that, that we were commenting on, um, bylines were an important part of that, speaking to this is how you can find out more information about this reporter. Why are they qualified to comment, uh, offer an opinion on this passage in a transcript? Um, making sure that um, you know, the, the sourcing was, th this, is a, this is writing in a specific way. It's not like writing like a tweet, it's not writing like an article. So thinking about the training of reporters and, and helping them think about how um, to, to craft an annotation in a, in a meaningful way. Um, making sure that the sourcing was a critical, you know, sourcing was a critical part of the annotation. Um, having a, the editorial curation to bring multiple perspectives onto, into a, a specific line in the transcript to have both the politics reporter and the senior business editor um, commenting on, on, on the same point, to bring different, different perspectives or different contexts to different statements. Um, and, that, and that ties into um, how, how, did, how did we establish trust in the annotation work that we were doing? And that's where I think the editor was so important to this process of being there in the beginning, doing the upfront planning of identifying the right reporters to comment on um, on a news event and identifying common themes, doing a little bit of upfront planning to say, these are the points that we want to hit on. These are what we expect um, this public figure to be speaking about. Uh, teaching and training uh, around establishing norms for how does an annotation work? How is it different than an article? How is it different than a tweet? Um, the line editing of having a backstop for the reporter as they're frantically finding and commenting on points having the support of an editor behind them to say, okay, we've, we're make, you know, this, is, this has been cleaned up, this is good to go. Um, and then having an editorial director that, that was thinking about the totality of annotations. Instead of just looking at the atomic unit, what do, what do all these annotations collectively say? Are we, are we being balanced in our, in our, in our um, annotating work? Are we just all diving onto a single point? Or is there value in, in understanding this as you know, all of the annotations put together? Um, so, that, that, I think, is, is a really, really important point that, the, you know, the, the editor played such a critical role in, in, in the annotation work. Um, I, I think, you know, just in the interest of time, I won't go into the full, I'll, I'll show these slides via the, the iAnnotation hashtag in, on Twitter, but um, the, the short answer for, for how we did all of this, we, we use Google Docs as a way that um, we had a transcription service being fed into a, a live Google Doc. Um, we had a Google app script that could go in and create um, a, a, a template that, that could then be interpreted um, by the code we wrote to translate um, the information in the Google Doc into the presentation that I shared a few slides ago. Um, so that, that's the basic workflow. I'll leave it at that, um, but happy to talk about the workflow in more detail later. Thank you. All right, okay. manual. So what, I'm, what we are working on um, is the coverage of climate change in mainstream media, or any media online. And as you can see on this uh, quick example, but well, I guess you know there is a lot of contradicting information online and we thought we, uh, we could benefit, uh, it could benefit the readers and journalists to have experts provide feedback on the content credibility. So that is the concept of uh, climate feedback. We now have about um, 200 uh, scientists in our network who volunteer to contribute when we uh, analyze articles. And I think one thing that is important uh, to note for everybody uh, is that the group that we brought together is um, motivated by a goal and they, they are coming here because they, they want to uh, help us 
help the public know which news they can trust. So that's one of the goals we have. And mostly that was the, the first one, but we realized that our interaction is more with editors, actually. Um, so we can provide feedback about the credibility of content, what the scientists think of their work. And the editors are usually the ones who can uh, make any modification or um, decide on improving the, the coverage. And also now we are starting to interact with people at Google and Facebook to also uh, have them be able to read what we provide uh, in terms of feedback on the credibility of content. So a quick overview of the way we work. We select only influential articles that can be checked for accuracy. That's the first step. And then we invite uh, scientists to annotate, analyze the article. So the, the good thing here is that they can collaborate on and also um, we can chop the, the work in small bites and ask scientists to only comment on one piece so that they can all contribute a small uh, amount of work and build together something that is complete. And the goal uh, of, uh, of them annotating is to provide, I mean, one of the goal is to provide an overall credibility assessment of the, of the article. In, and we ask people to rate the credibility on a scale from minus two to plus two, on very low to very high. So what we um, understood from these two years of practice that we are doing now is that there are mostly six dimensions scientists are commenting on when they um, justify the, the ratings that they provide, is whether the facts are accurate, whether the uh, the science is understood, so I think there, are, there is a clear distinction between getting facts and understanding um, what they mean, then having an argument that is uh, logical, and I won't go into all the details, but one thing that is quite important uh, is the, the sources, what, what the reporting is supported by. Is it anchored in reality, in uh, having really evidence and experts to uh, give credibility to the, to the reporting. And the last step of our process is to provide feedback to the editor, but also to provide this feedback publicly. So I think at this point you all know what it can look like when you have, this is a screenshot of a web browser with a piece of text that has been annotated, and in this case you have a, um, a figure of a temperature data set and uh, the scientist here provided a, a longer part of the data set to show uh, that maybe that, that piece that was shown was uh, practicing cherry picking, just showing a little bit of the data. So just one illustration. And once we have all these uh, comments from the scientists, we uh, present them on our own website, climatefeedback.org, and we publish an analysis where we display uh, the tags that uh, people have mostly used in commenting the content, and the rating, so in this case, this Daily Mail article, uh, most people gave it a very low rating, one person um, a low, and you can see who the, the reviewers are. And I think that's interesting, that's a little bit uh, what you were describing. We have this process of collecting annotation comments, but then the way we display them on our website is that we organize them here in key takeaways. So we summarize what this annotation talk about, and then we have a list of, this is the, uh, the, the piece of text that is being commented, and this is the scientist and what he says. So it's also important, as you were saying, to justify the expertise of the person. Um, and here we have a, a link to the professional page of these people, but also showing well who they are and what they know about the topic. And one of the things that is important for scientists uh, is to know that what they do is actually useful, has some impact. They don't just comment for, for the pleasure of that. So one thing that we make sure is that at least the um, editors hear about what the scientists have done but also on social media, you can also public, publicly call out the, the person. And 
in some cases like here, uh, oops, that's still where the discussion happens. So on Twitter, for instance, really, once we have made all this work of annotating and analyzing, then people usually point to our analysis because it's um, easier to read and to uh, digest. And in, in some cases also journalists use what we do to build on their own reporting and uh, politicians like recently uh, Congressman Don Bayer who used our annotation of transcript of um, House Science Climate Hearing to add it to the official record. So that's another way that we make sure that what the scientists produce uh, is being used. And uh, one more um, avenue for the future is that what we are doing can also be used by the, the main point where people consume the news, uh, which is still Facebook, Google, and Twitter in, in some ways. And they, they all said that they want to provide more information about the credibility of information for Facebook. Uh, what they are working on is showing in the related posts or related content the fact check of um, target articles or articles that contain the claim that is being checked. So that's still in development. One thing that is already operational is that they show a little uh, pop-up before you share something if that is, has been fact checked uh, by one of the fact checker of the International Fact Checking Network. So if you try to share something that has been um, checked as false, you, you might see this uh, little pop-up. And in Google, recently, they also announced that they would feature the fact check first or uh, high in the uh, search uh, results. So these are general direction that we are working on now. But uh, to open maybe the, the discussion, I think one of the um, important things that we do uh, with annotation is really a working phase where we analyze and that, that all this set of annotation has to be then promoted and publicized. So there, there is really a two-step process where we work with the content, ask questions, have the scientists to answer that, but then present what we found in another format. And I think that's, that brings consideration about what we should do with annotation to, to respect that use. And another thing that I think can be then useful is to use annotation to maybe automatically go and find information about sources or the links that are being uh, pointed to. So if you can surface information that can help either the students or the scientists. So if anyone want, wants to work on you know, automated ways of tracing back claims where they originate from or sources who these people are or links, what is really that you're going to, to get when you click and bring all this content that can help people analyze and go faster in their fact-checking. Thanks. Fine. So if you would raise your hand if you have a question for this panel, uh, I will try to keep order of who's uh, asking questions and then we'll deliver a mic to you. I know you guys are hungry. We're going we're gonna to break for lunch right after this. So. OK, yeah, they're in the back. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm T.S. Waterman. Um, this is a question generally for the panel. Um, do you think there's any way to um, aggregate annotations from multiple people, scientists, experts, general public, whoever, in order to get kind of a general score of the trustworthiness of a source or a particular article? Um, is um, a lot of the techniques and strategies you out and you've talked about teaching people are sort of you know personal investigation uh, following it around trying to make a decision for yourself do you, do you think there's any way to kind of automatically aggregate uh, voting or scores that have been put on by the by the annotators yeah, I, I would say getting to uh, from the annotation to the overall credibility score for us at least because we have the two we have these comments that scientists make, and then we ask them to give a credibility score for the story. And it's really hard to jump from one to the next. I don't think you can say, comment on this, on this, on that, and then say, oh, based on that, then it's of low credibility. It's quite hard, because the scientists are always going to criticize something. 
they're going to say, oh, but there, there is a problem here. But that doesn't always translate to low credibility. It can be a, a small problem. So I think it's going to be extremely hard to make anything automatic based on that. Maybe some natural language detection of sentiment, like I'm feeling very negative about this content, but I would say it's probably not something machines can do. I think going back to something that was said this morning um, to speak to this point, the, the idea of filters is, is interesting to me that um, I think it would be hard to automatically aggregate all of that into the same stack of annotations, but the idea that a source document could be a place that um, could be a venue for multiple viewpoints to be explored is, is interesting. And, and maybe there's, you know, I, I also see the design challenges of, of aggregation of just the sheer mass of, of annotation um, if you're bringing in multiple viewpoints. So some way of providing some hierarchy or order to that. Um. Uh, sure. Thanks for the mic. In, in the same way that uh, you know, Google has done an amazing job of re-ranking uh, web search based not on where they started, which was looking at the link graph, but actually looking at user behavior, um, there may be, I mean, and I'm just riffing on this, there's no, obviously no answer yet, but there, uh, one could use sort of the aggregate uh, annotation and number of, and as you were talking about sentiment and words involved in them, in order to at least get a feel for what people are generally saying about this versus that. Any thoughts? Yeah, I get two, two, two quick remarks on that. One is that as we think about a credibility score, um, we probably want to expand that. And um, Claire Wardle at First Draft has done some really good work charting the different types of misinformation out there. Um, and otherwise, you get a, a, a scenario where a parody or a satire um, is, is swept in with uh, some, some malicious information or where a parody or satire tag is employed by a, a you know, outfit um, or an, uh, a disreputable outfit as a way of getting past certain filters. So, um, and, and then the, the, the notion of, of there being an aggregate, um, it, it's, uh, it, it's valid until that becomes a very important indicator and then it gets gamed. And, and so we, you know, we have to acknowledge that, um, so. Yeah, I like the, the way you say it's going to get gamed, because I think language is so flexible, you can always find a way to get your message across. If you want to spread misinformation, you can always twist what you say in a way that uh, looks like it's satire, maybe, but it's, it's still something that is uh, false information you're propagating. But I think there are probably a set of criteria that objectively can be measured around sources, around the, the quality of what's produced about the sources that are being cited, and that can give you an indication of the trust a priori you can have in the content. And maybe then I, I would say you need a human to finish the, the work. Um, a question, Aviv? Uh, yeah, so um, this is uh, for you, Manuel. Um, can you ask the scientists to sort of mark how important that claim that they're responding to is? Or are you doing that already? Because if you do that, um, if you ask them how important it is and like, uh, how credible that claim is, um, then that might, that might potentially be able to aggregate it into their final score. And I would say have them do all of this and then see if there is some, some function from the, um, and I'm curious if that's something you've, you've explored at all. And I have one other follow-up. So we do ask, but in a way that is soft, if you want, we just tell them focus on what matters or things like that, but we don't have a way to encode that right. in a systematic way. But I think that's probably one thing we would need. I'm not sure if argumentation structure of the text could help here, because if maybe you could detect this is the central claim or something like that right. by someone else, not the scientist, but maybe someone who studies rhetoric. 
and build these things together. Yeah, that would be. And the, the other thing I just was just to clarify the previous question, we talked about sort of a credibility score and parity. I feel like there's a sense of, or this, like how much should I trust this this source of information to be accurate? Is sort of what I think of, and I'm I'm curious how that ties into sort of your your model of a credibility score. Because if I'm going to buy a stock, whether it's a parity site or not, I want to know because then I'll know if I should buy that stock or not based off the information on that site. And so I think there is this sort of global sense of credibility score that does incorporate parity as just not something I should trust. And I'm curious how that ties into sort of your models of, of credibility and if that's, if that's an accurate statement, maybe from Mike also. Anyone else want to take that as a follow-up? Okay, and you can condensate the question. I'm not sure I, I got really. Uh, so How you think about um, credibility and if you were to sort of create some sort of outcome that is a rating, like is the model of how much should I trust this in order to take actions in the world? Is that the model that you use or do you have a different model um, for what is the general sort of credibility of a source? Like yeah. if you could reduce that to a single thing, is that something that you yeah, think is so possible? The way we do it, we have, um, so most of our work our students do on wiki and so we need a common definition. Uh, and what we say is that a, a fact is something that is generally agreed on by people, in, people that know, people in a position to know that are inclined to tell the truth. And those are, those are our criteria, right? Uh, and we actually try to get students, instead of focusing, everybody gets hung up on that inclined to tell the truth piece, right? Like, oh, it's the New York Times, they're liberal, they have bias, it's you know, something else, they have a, a different bias. You know, what we actually find is that it, for any given fact, there's actually a very small number of people in the world that are in a position to actually know. So we try to get the students to focus on that first, understand who are the people in a position to know the truth of this fact, look for a consensus in them, and then if they find a division in the consensus um, among those people in a position to know, then start to address questions of, uh, of bias and you know, inclination. Um, to, to speak to the credibility score from a design perspective for a second, I, I would say that this is where user needs analysis could come in really handy of if, if you're presenting a, a credibility score to an end user, how, how are they equipped to interpret it? And an expert can interpret a credi credibility score with a background that an end user may not be able to. So I think about like an analogy like Google Analytics. Like if you just share Google Analytics uh, and here are your top line dashboard numbers. Depending on how familiar you are with how analytics systems work, you could interpret those numbers very differently in a positive way or in a negative way. So I think um, anytime you think about automating um, something like credibility, you, you need to think about the context of the user and how they're gonna come to, to make sense of it. And, and I think that that's a big role for us as, as, um, you know, as designers to, to create systems, to create um, structure to, to help extract meaning from, from something like that. Oh, great. Um, I want to ask, uh, uh, or bring Stefan into the conversation, and um, one, of, one of the themes we've been hearing is, you know, uh, expert networks. It's, it's, it's a fantastic filter. It's a great way to solve a lot of the problems of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, open annotation. I'm curious to know, uh, question is Stefan, to what extent uh, has his group experimented with opening up contributions um, uh, around data cleaning or uh, entity uh, structuring uh, from users uh, generally or a broader community or, or is, is, the, uh, is the work and security considerations um, such that, that everything is, is closed. Right, so you, you, you got the, the, the idea. Well, everybody is um, going into the way of trying to uh, fact-checking fact communities in the public using annotation information. We are kind of running in the opposite direction where we keep the annotation as either a tool to uh, enrich source documents that are secret during the pre-publication phase, or um, we are using these uh, the annotations. We were trying to use annotations as a bridge between applications uh, to kind of streamline our investigative pro process. But nevertheless, we are talking about a big community of 
journalists working together. So you can see it as a, a, a as a um, pretty big group that is um, working together on, on documents and collaborating and needs some sorts of tools that they're, that are not there yet. So we didn't have any uh, meaningful um, experience yet uh, after publication. And it's, you know, it's also a, a, an issue that it's a technical issue for now that you cannot toggle in between uh, uh, um, states of uh, pre-publication, post-publication with the same source uh, documents or to consider to publish uh, the batch of your annotations when you feel it's safe and you, you go publish the uh, stories. And we have the same issue with other uh, tools we are using. And indeed it's a waste, but it's a technical issue we are trying to consider, this, this moving in between uh, secrecy and public work. Talk about uh, open networks and and uh, user. Uh, there are a couple of questions in here about. Uh, 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 yeah, or, or generally, how do you view? Uh, one question was how how do you bring the deniers into the uh, into the discussion, and or or how do you put your uh, work in front of the deniers? So, how do you bring in uh, the discussion? I'm not sure. I mean, first we need to define who who they are. I don't know, I mean, deniers, um, it's not a word that we usually use. I think within the world of scientists, we might say there are some contrarians who reject the majority of uh, evidence that every other scientist agree on, and there are very, very little of them. And so far, we didn't have uh, the, the question of um, getting them in the discussion because they did not join the discussion. And so I don't think for us, it's a big problem. Now, if you go to denier, I guess maybe you're more talking about bloggers or this kind of people. And it's not really our goal to bring them in the discussion at this stage. Now, um, was there another part to the question? How, how do or we how bring? Do you get your information in but public? now, what I want to really uh, say is we, we strive to bring a diversity of voices within climate scientists you don't have all the people who agree on the severity maybe of the problem. So we, we, have, our, we have rules of uh, who we want to accept and those who do propagate false information, we, we try to not uh, engage at all. Now you have people um, that are not maybe the most alarmist and they are, okay, it's, you know, it's not as much as a problem as other people say and these people we try to bring in as much as we can. So we have a diversity of voices and we don't have just, you know, one subgroup that dominate all the production that we, we have. And there's also a question in the audience. Great, uh, okay, to the audience, please. Yeah, I asked one of the questions on the notepad. Um, if some of you want to get your information in front of the people who are reading the original article, so like that Gardasil article, you want, you want people to see that, but it's not your article, so you want people to see annotations from a third party. Others, like NPR or, or maybe some of the other commentary, but the, um, if your commentary goes up on the investigative journalism, you don't want people coming in and changing, you know, overlaying that, maybe coming up with something that claims to be just as authoritative on your website. How do you deal with that tension? I mean, who controls what people see and how do you get in, in, in front of the people you want to see it and not have your own content be disputed or something on your own website? Uh, so, I mean, first I'll, I'll make a clarification. I think from my perspective, um, while, it, while it is nice for students to do public work that actually is seen by others and may help others reach their own decision. The most important part to me, again, is that the process of a, the process of annotation gets our students thinking in a way that is about sourced information, is about you know uh, the the you know network of, of of the web, right? So, so even if that information doesn't get in front of the right people, I think the process of doing it is is one that's really beneficial to our to our students. Um, 
you know, that said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, you know, my, my big worry about annotation in terms of things like these junk articles is, uh, you know, as someone said, I forget what it's called, it's like Bartlett's Law or something, that as soon as you uh, have any metric, um, you know, which is influential and has real world impact, you go into, it becomes gamed and, and hence becomes meaningless. So, so there is, so the tension from my perspective is as we start, you know, scaling this up, um, the, you know, in all likelihood, as soon as it becomes influential, the same way, uh, you know, spam happened, the same way, uh, you know, fake and satirical news learned how to game the Facebook system, uh, you know, people will start to game annotations. And so, you know, what's the, what's the answer to that? I think from my perspective as an educator, the answer to that is we try to inculcate in our students the right habits of mind and the right reflexes to deal with that world, and then we leave it to these guys to solve all the hard problems. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I think unless anyone has any uh, closing uh, remarks that want to make, uh, we should consider uh, moving on to lunch. And uh, so thanks, thanks uh, to the panel, uh, and uh, thanks everybody. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks.